I was studying a PhD at Monash University. I was trying to understand the proteins that initiate contraction during labor. Now, this was a, a really, really fascinating topic. I absolutely loved it. We would get bits of uterus from ladies who had had a C-section that morning and donated us a little bit, and we would uh, test on this, try to understand how these contractions begin. Now, one thing I noticed as I started my studies at Monash University is that most people there don't believe in creation. Most people there believe in evolution. And when I noticed this, I decided to really look into the topic. I wanted to see, does the evidence stand on the side of evolution or does the evidence stand more on the side of creation? And I literally looked into this for hundreds of hours. And after I was uh, convinced that the evidence stands on the side of creation, I remember one day I was in the physiology building and it was around 6 p.m. Now, the students often uh, got together there and we would chat over uh, tea and so forth. And this night there were two girls in the room. One of them was of the Hindu faith and one of them was a uh, Buddhist. And we started talking about the various things that we believe. The Hindu girl was talking about how she doesn't eat beef because she believes that, that cows are gods. And we started just talking about the various things that each of us believe. And at one point in this um, discussion, many more people started coming into the room. And there were, after about 15 minutes, there were nine other people in the room besides myself. And we started just discussing the various things that we believed. I remember one of those, one of the people was an atheist, two of them were agnostics, one person was of the Islam faith. There was a really uh, good spread of the various belief systems. And as we were talking about the various things that we believe, at one point the topic went to evolution. And at that time I said, I don't believe in evolution. Now the room went silent. You could hear like a pin drop. Everyone was, was looking at me. I almost expected them to say, heretic, burn him. But they, they said, how can you not believe in evolution? What about all the proof there is? And I said, look, I've looked into this matter. I've been really researching this for the, the past few months and I have yet to find this proof. Maybe I've missed it. Why don't you guys tell me what the proof is and then, then I'll believe it. And we spent the next three hours talking about this. In this time, my colleagues realized that the proof that they thought was there wasn't actually there. Two of them, as they left, said to me, Marius, we know that we haven't shown you the proof, but we're going to find it and we'll bring it to you. And I said, yeah, that's great. I, I'd be happy to look at it if it's there. Now, I remember I, I left that room on my high horse and went straight up to my professor. My professor's name is Professor Helena Parkington. She is a leading researcher in her field. In fact, only one other person in the world does the kind of experiments that she does. She's uh, devised the treatment for preterm labor to, uh, to stop the, the labor coming on, which now treats one person in Australia around every 15 and a half minutes. She's a, a brilliant lady. And I went up to her and I said, Helena, you can't prove evolution. Now in the scientific community, this is like grabbing a rubber glove and whacking someone on the back of the head. And she looked at me and said something really interesting. She looked at me and said, I know, you can't prove creation. I learned something very interesting that day. I learned that the people on the lower end of the educational food chain, the undergraduates, the postgraduates, the honor students, the PhD students, they all believe that evolution is a fact and that it can be proven. However, the people that are teaching this, the people at the top end of the educational food chain, they know that evolution can't be proven. However, they teach it as fact.
So we're going to have a, a little look today at what evolution is. So when someone says evolution, they can mean one of uh, many steps in what's uh, considered to be the evolutionary pathway. So we'll have a look at them. The first step that would need to occur for evolution to happen would be the evolution of matter. Then this matter would need to assemble itself in atoms and elements, and then you'd need to have stars and planets. Then you would have the evolution of life, and then this life would diversify into the evolution of species. After this, you'd have something which is called variation. Variation is the changing in pre-existing species. Now, this is something that creationists believe and evolutionists believe. Creationists believe that God created us with the capability to vary within our genome. And evolutionists believe that we evolved this way. So I just want to say that variation isn't something that just belongs to evolution. It also belongs to creation. So we're going to have a look at the first five of these. Let's have a look at the evolution of matter. We are told that matter evolved by a big bang. I'm sure many of us have heard um, this term, the big bang. Now, we're told, depending on the textbooks that you look at, between 13 and 20 billion years ago. Uh, most common textbooks say it's around 18.6 billion years ago. There was a big bang. And we're told that there was a really, really small thing that exploded. Some uh, textbooks say it was smaller than the full stop on your page. This really, really small thing exploded. Some even go further and say that this infinitesimally small dot was in fact nothing. And it exploded and gave us everything. Now, let's have a look and see, is, is this possible? You see, the Big Bang violates many laws which we see today. It violates the conservation of energy, it violates the conservation of matter, it violates Einstein's theory of relativity which says that things can't travel faster than the speed of light. You see, we're told that as the Big Bang happened, things moved out faster than the speed of light. Now, I was actually reading an article just recently about, um, from an evolutionist who was trying to explain how these things could have moved faster than the speed of light, and he said that, oh, Einstein's theory of relativity didn't come into play until 100 seconds after the Big Bang. I remember looking at this and I was like, ah, that's convenient. When, when the laws don't fit in with your theory, say, oh no, it, it wasn't around then, it only came into being later. There is serious problems with the evolution of matter. Now, once matter did evolve, you would need it to coalesce into atoms and elements. You'd need the quarks and the neutrinos to come together to form atoms. Now, is this possible? Well, according to the Big Bang Theory, as it exploded, everything is moving away from each other, from the explos explosion point. So how do things coalesce to form atoms and elements? But this is what we're told, so this is what we are supposed to believe. They say, oh, what was formed was only hydrogen and helium. And you're like, okay, what about the other 92 elements besides the synthetic ones? They say, oh, these came around inside stars. Now this poses a big problem. How did stars evolve? You see, we're told that the hydrogen and helium came together under gravity and formed stars. But you have a big problem. As there is no mass, there is nowhere to make this gravity for these stars to form. As you only have hydrogen and helium, the amount of gravity a hydrogen atom would create is negligible. So how could they form together to make stars? This is something, again, that's a serious problem with the theory of evolution. Now, the evolution of life, we're going to have a little closer look uh, in, in a few moments. But again, this has serious problems with it as well, as does the evolution of species, which we'll also look at in, in a few minutes. The only thing that we observe is variation. You see, as this image suggests, 
in a dog, you have the genetic information to make a Chihuahua or to have a Great Dane. All that genetic information is there in every dog. It just depends on the variation of the expression of these genes as to what kind of dog that you will have. Now, we are often sold this as microevolution. You see, this is a way that people believing in evolution say, oh, see, this is microevolution. But I like to say that it's not microevolution, it's variation. Because by saying it's microevolution, people try to wedge the idea of evolution into, into one's mind. So we looked at what is evolution? Well, the first five steps of evolution have serious problems with them. All we observe is variation. Now, how did we come up with the theory of evolution? How did Darwin come up with this theory of evolution? Ironically, the way that he came up with this theory was because of his religious beliefs. You see, Darwin believed that God created immutable species. This means species incapable of variation. This was commonly believed in the religious world at the time. And, and Darwin had this belief, and when he went to the Galapagos Islands, he saw these finches which clearly had adapted to their environment. Now, when he saw this, he had two options. The first option was to say, oh, maybe God didn't create immutable species. Maybe he created species capable of variation. The other option, which is the one that he chose, was to say, oh, maybe God didn't create at all. Now, one of the uh, things which I'm, I'm convinced that this led to the theory of evolution was the way that they understood the cell at the time. The cell at the time was believed to consist of what they called homogeneous protoplasm, which simply means undifferentiated goo. They thought that the cell is an extremely simple uh, unit and it's just made of stuff that's all pretty similar. Now, this allowed Darwin to say, okay, well, if this is kind of simple, it may have just come around by itself and arranged itself into life. However, our understanding of the cell today is vastly different from the understanding of the cell they had at the time. We know today that each cell consists of over 100,000 different types of proteins. That's not 100,000 different proteins, different types of proteins and numerous expressions of each of these proteins, some of them in the hundreds of thousands. Now, I'm convinced that if Darwin had the understanding of the cell that we had today, that he would have never come up with his theory. So let's have a look at what would be involved in the evolution of life. So you would need to evolve a cell to begin with. Now, cells, what they tell us is, oh, we didn't evolve these complex cells. We evolved simple cells. But don't be deceived. There's no such thing as a simple cell. All of the cells are highly complex. This cell is a bacteria, and it consists of over 4,000 different types of proteins, all of them arranged in highly specific ways. Many of them express thousands and hundreds of thousands of times. Now, what would be needed for this cell to come around by itself is for the proteins to assemble themselves. Now, this is an image of a protein, and this is another computer-generated image of a smaller protein. So, what would be involved in having a small protein come around by itself? You see, proteins are made up of amino acids. 20 amino acids are used to make up all the proteins that, that we have today. In the world, we don't just find 20 different types of amino acids. We find a little over 270, but only 20 of them are used to, uh, to make up life. Now, what would be involved in assembling a small protein by itself? Well, you would need to have these amino acids assemble themselves 
in exactly the correct order. Now, the first problem that we have is that you need a protein to put these amino acids together. So you need a protein to form the other protein. So you have the chicken and, or the egg problem, which came first, the protein, or the protein that assembled the protein. The other problem is that once it's assembled, you need another protein to fold it into the correct configuration. But let's ignore this for a second and just, just say that they can self-assemble, which they can't, but we'll say that they can. What's the likelihood that they can self-arrange? Well, I've, I've done the maths and the likelihood for a small protein. Now, I'm looking at a protein of 150 amino acids. Your average protein in a, let's say, yeast cell is about 464 amino acids, but this is a very small protein. The likelihood of this protein to come around by itself is one in one times 10 to the six, 164. That is one with 164 zeros after it. Now, this number is so mind-bogglingly big that we, we just can't comprehend it. So, I'm going to um, give you an example so it may help you understand it. It's believed that in the known universe, there is 1 times 10 to the 80 atoms altogether. So the likelihood of this protein coming together by itself is like me saying, I have marked two atoms somewhere in the universe. What you need to do is to find them. You need to find them consecutively without any mistakes. So what you need to do is to get into your spaceship, travel to one out of 100,000 million galaxies. Now you have to choose the right one. And from there you'd need to travel to one of 200,000 million solar systems. And again, you need to choose the correct one. Go to the correct planet, to the correct side of the planet, to the correct seashore, pick up the correct grain of sand. And in this grain of sand is one million billion billion atoms. So that's one with 24 zeros after it atoms. And there, you would need to choose the correct atom. And once you've done this, you need to do it again. And you can't make any mistakes. Absolutely impossible. However, a gentleman called George Wilde gave us an interesting statement. He says, given so much time, the impossible becomes possible, the possible becomes probable, and the probable virtually certain. One only has to wait, time itself performs the miracles. Now, this is an interesting statement and it sounds kind of believable. What essentially he's saying is that if you flip a coin enough times, you will eventually get 20 heads in a row. However, what most people don't sit and do is they don't sit and do the maths. Now, I love maths. And for the next two or so minutes, we're going to do some maths. So uh, if you don't like maths, I'll promise it'll be quick and painless. What we're going to have a look at is the likelihood that this protein will come around given the time that we have. And what you would do to work this out is you'd need to look at the number of atoms that are involved in, uh, in this process. Then you would need to multiply that by the reaction speed. And then you would need to multiply that by the time that you have. So let's say, which atoms would be involved in this evolutionary process? Well, it would be the atoms on the immediate surface of the Earth in the places where the conditions are favorable. But we want to give them the benefit of the doubt. So we'll say, not just those atoms, not just all the atoms on the world, but every single atom in the universe. We'll give them the benefit of the doubt. The reaction speed that we're gonna look at is a reaction speed much faster than is commonly observed today. And the time that we're going to look at, we won't just say 18.6 billion years, we'll say a time period 100,000 times more than what's believed. We wanna give them every benefit of the doubt. So the likelihood of this is 1 times 10 to the 114, which still leaves 
50 zeros unaccounted for. Modern mathematics tells us today that anything that has a probability 1 in 1 times 10 to the 50 is impossible. So essentially, what these equations are telling us is that even if all the atoms in the universe were trying to make this protein at a rate much faster than is commonly observed for a time over a hundred thousand times more than we is believed to have existed, it's still absolutely impossible. And this is for one single small protein. If you did by some miracle get this small protein, and don't be deceived, you would need a miracle of God to get this small protein. If you did get it, well then you would still need another 3,999 different types of proteins, all assembled in the correct way. Life evolving is, is just not possible. So what about the evolution of species? Is it possible that species could evolve if life had evolved? Now we've just realized that life can't evolve, but let's say that it did. Can species evolve? The thing that science has been looking for essentially since Charlie came up with his idea, was links between the various species. And a big one that they look for today is a link between humans and apes. Now many have been proposed throughout time. One was Nebraska man. Nebraska man was said, oh, we have found the missing link. What they found was a tooth. That's it one single tooth. From this, they concluded that, oh, this is the missing link. It was later discovered that this was a pig's tooth. Another one that um, is very well known is Piltdown Man. Piltdown Man was discovered by Charles Dawson. And essentially, what Charles did is he got an ape mandible. He filed it down and he articulated it with a human cranium and said, oh, this is the missing link. For 41 years, this was accepted as the missing link until it was finally discovered that, that it was a, a, a forgery. However, when it was discovered, it still persisted in the textbooks. One that we still have in our textbooks today is Neanderthal man. Neanderthal man is said, oh, you see, this is one of the missing links. Now, the thing that makes Neanderthal man different from any other skeleton is the fact that he has a pronounced supraorbital ridge. He or she has a pronounced supraorbital ridge, which means the area just above the eye is more pronounced than we commonly see in, in human skulls today. I have here... A, uh, a human skull. It's a real human skull. And you'll see that the supraorbital ridge here is far less pronounced than the one in, in, the, in the image there. Now, we are told that, oh, you see, this means that this skeleton was primitive. Well, let's have a look at some other modern skulls that we see today. I have here an image of four skulls of different races that we, we have in the world today. Now you'll see that different skulls look slightly different. Some of them are more robust, others are smaller. In fact, if you look at the Australian Aboriginal, you'll see that the supraorbital ridge is even more pronounced than that of Neanderthal man. What I believe Neanderthal man to have been is simply a race of humans that is no longer around. They may have been wiped out, maybe because of war, maybe because of some catastrophe, or maybe some disease or plague, and they're simply not around with us anymore. The biggest evidence that we are given for evolution today is Lucy. We are told that Lucy is the missing link. In this image, you have Lucy standing upright, you have a child that she's holding who is standing upright and someone in the background, maybe a guy bringing her a bone, that he's also standing upright. 
And you'd think that they must have found some amazing group of skeletons to be able to recreate this image. This is what they found. This is the real Lucy. Lucy was an Australopithecus afarensis, which is a fancy way of saying she was an ape. She was about so tall, um, three feet, just under a meter tall. And we are told that she walked upright. Now, what made her walk upright? They tell us, oh, do you see the hip bone there? That hip bone suggests that she walked upright. However, that hip bone doesn't suggest she walked upright. But they say, ah, oh, no, no, no. If it was twisted, then she may have walked upright. And yes, if it was twisted, she may have walked upright, but we have no way of knowing that it was twisted because there's no other hip bone on the other side to compare it to. So all we have is the hip bone of an ape, which is the same as all the other hip bones of apes that have been found so far. But what they tell us is, no, no, no. The thing that made Lucy walk upright is the articulation between the femur and the tibia. The knee joint there shows that Lucy walked upright. And the truth is that the knee joint there does appear to suggest that Lucy walked upright. However, there is something that we are not told in the textbooks. There is something that Donald Johansson, who is the discoverer of Lucy, hasn't actually told anyone until about eight years later, when he was confronted at a uh, conference that he had by a creationist. The femur of this skeleton, which is the only thing that makes this skeleton different from any other ape, was not found with the rest of the skeleton. In fact, it was found in a different dig site, over 2.3 kilometers away, 70 meters deeper in the strata. So, what makes one think that this femur belonged to this skeleton? I, I believe that this skeleton was here. That femur belonged to what other, whatever other bones it was found with. Now, this information that is strangely absent from textbooks today. We're not told this. We're not told that, oh yes, this does look different, but this bone was found in, in a different dig site. They don't tell us these things. In fact, we are often fed misleading information. I was looking at this presentation just a few weeks ago, and it's from the California Academy of Sciences. And it looks, it's, it's an animation, I just have a screenshot of it here. The chimpanzee moves around and Lucy moves around and the human also moves. And what they're trying to show is that Lucy has things in common with the chimpanzee and with the human. Now, you'll notice that in this image, they have uh, put a box around the feet. They put that box there, not me. So what they're doing is they're highlighting the feet of Lucy. And what they're telling us by doing this is, do you see? Lucy's feet are like that of the human. Do you see the chimpanzee has opposable thumbs or toes, I guess? But Lucy has feet like that of a human. This suggests that she's the missing link. So let's have a look. Let's have a look. What kind of feet did Lucy have? Oh, there were no feet. Why does the California Academy of Sciences deliberately tried to deceive us by showing us that she has feet similar to that of a human when there were no feet found at all. In fact, this is not uncommon. If you would go to the St. Louis Zoo in Missouri, they have made a statue of Lucy and they've given her human feet. And one of the local professors wrote in and he said, this statue's feet and hands are simply wrong, and they mislead the public. Now, what would you expect the, the zoo to do? You think, oh, we didn't realize we've made a mistake. We're, we're going to fix it. This is what the zoo responded. We can't be updating every exhibit based on every new piece of evidence, he says. We look at the overall exhibit and the impression it creates. We think that the overall impression this exhibit creates 
is correct. We can't look at the evidence, forget about the evidence. We're interested in the impression. We're not interested in the facts that we've found, we're interested in what we want you to believe, the impression we want to send you. That is more important to us than the facts. Now, the missing link is still missing. And Charlie had a problem with this. He actually wrote about this in his book. He, he noticed that there wasn't these missing links that he was expecting to see. And he writes, why then is not every geological formation and every stratum full of such intermediate links? Geology assuredly does not reveal any such finely graduated organic chains. And this perhaps is the most obvious and gravest objection which can be urged against my theory. You see, Charles said, I'm expecting to find all these missing links, but I can't find them. And the fact that they're not around is, is a serious problem for my theory. However, he hoped that they would be found. It's now over 150 years later, and they still have yet to be found. Now, one of the things that you need to have in order to have a diversification of species is you need to have genetic mutations. You need the genome to add new genetic material to get a new species. That's what you need for evolution. Now, do we observe genetic mutations today? Yes? Yep, that's right. We do observe genetic mutations today. I'm here to confess that I am a mutant. My superpower is that I'm colorblind. Uh, about, about an hour ago, as I, I was uh, driving in here, I noticed that there was, a, there was a rainbow in the background. I can only see the yellow and the blue in the rainbow. Unless it's a very strong rainbow, then I can sometimes see a third color. I have these colorblindness glasses, which I sometimes put on, and I'm like, oh, wow. But because of a genetic mutation, I cannot see colors properly. I don't have enough red and green receptors in the cones of my eyes, and I, I just can't see colors properly. This is common. Genetic mutations are common. You have Down syndrome is the result of a genetic mutation. You have hemophilia is the result of a genetic mutation. Now, what you would need for a new species to arise is new positive genetic mutations. The ones that I've spoken about are genetic mutations where it's the degradation of pre-existing genetic material. So it's not making new material that causes these problems, it's destroying pre-existing material. For you to have a new species, what you need to have is new genetic material. Now your average species contains about 200 million base pairs to code for this uh, genetic information, essentially. And we're told that throughout time, there's been around 2 billion species. So you'd expect to see a new species every three or four months. You'd expect to see a new species evolving. Now, to have a new organism, you wouldn't need all of the genetic material to be new. You just need part of it. For example, um, we share the same genetic information, 87% of the same genetic information with a mouse. The difference between us and a mouse is 13% in our genetic information. We actually share about 50% of the same genetic information with a banana, believe it or not. Now, to have a new species, you need, let's say, around 5% of new genetic information. So you'd expect to be seeing around 10 million new base pairs coming around every three or four months. Now, what do we observe? Is, is this what we observe? So I've done the maths, I've looked at the, I've added up all the positive genetic mutations that we have found since Charles came up with his theory. And this is the number. Zero. We have yet to find one single positive genetic mutation. So why do we say that species can evolve? So we've so far looked at the reasons and the, the serious problems with the theory of evolution. 
But I want to ask, is there any evidence to suggest that we were created? Because sometimes people say, oh no, evolution isn't possible, and they leave it at that. Now just disproving a theory doesn't mean that your theory is necessarily right. So we're now going to have a look at, is there evidence to suggest creation? The universe around us appears to have been created with us in mind. Now why do I say that? I say that because certain things have been arranged, there are certain constants in the world that have been arranged to be exactly the way they need to be for life to occur. For example, if you were to walk into this church and you notice that there was a little um, bouquet of flowers attached to every one of the pews and then there was some material in between each one of them and there were some bridesmaids at the front and there was some groomsmen on the side and there was a bride in the middle, you would think, oh, there's a wedding going on. Right? The things that you see around show you that this place has been prepared for a wedding. Now, the universe appears to have been prepared with life in mind. We're going to look at a few of these constants. The first one is the expansion of the universe. The universe around us is expanding at a highly specific rate. This rate is specific to 1 times 10 to the 121. That's 1 with 121 zeros after it. And it needs to be that specific. If it was any less, the universe would implode in on itself. If it was any more, then you wouldn't be able to support complex life. If we look at our location in the galaxy, it appears that we were put in a place in the galaxy with us in mind. We're about two-thirds of the way out from the center of the galaxy in what's known as the habitable zone. If we were any closer to the center, there'd be too much radiation to support complex life. If we were any further than we are, there wouldn't be enough heavy elements to support complex life. We also happen to be in between the spiral arms. If we were in the actual spiral arms, we wouldn't be able to see out. But because we're in between them, we can actually observe the universe around us. The solar system appears to have been created with us in mind. We are the exact right distance we need to be from the sun. If we were any closer, it would be too hot to support life. If we were any further away, it would be too cold to support life. The Earth's orbit happens to be exactly like it needs to be. If you look at the orbit of every other planet in our solar system, you'll see that the orbit is elliptical. Earth's orbit, however, is not elliptical. It's circular. It is slightly elliptical, but predominantly circular. Now, if it was more elliptical, then you would have periods of very strong heat and periods of, of very cold periods. Again, life as we know it couldn't exist. Our sun happens to be just the right color. If it was any more towards the blue spectrum or the red, then photosynthesis wouldn't function either at all or wouldn't function properly. And life as we know it wouldn't work. The moon happens to be just the right size and just the right distance away from the Earth. If the moon was any bigger or any closer to the Earth, you would have massive tidal action and there'd be tidal waves all around the world and life as we know it couldn't exist. If the moon was any smaller or further away, then you would not have enough tidal action. The seas would become stagnant and life as we know it wouldn't function. The atom appears to have been created with life in mind. You see, the proton is much bigger than the electron. In fact, the proton is 1,836 times bigger than the electron. However, the charge is identical. It's opposite, but it's identical. If the charge wasn't identical, complex life couldn't exist. If the proton was any bigger or smaller, or if the electron was any bigger or smaller, complex life couldn't exist. It appears that all of these constants, I've just gone through a, a few of them, there's over 40 that I know of, that need to be exactly right for life to exist. Now a lot of people 
say to me, what about a universal flood, Marius? In fact, I had a, a good friend that asked me this um, a couple of months ago. He's like, Marius, do you really believe in a universal flood? And I say, yeah, I believe that there was a worldwide flood. I said, well, how, how can you believe that? I said, well, because there's much evidence to suggest it. I was at the Grand Canyon about 11 years ago. It's, a, it's an amazing place. It is so big that any photos that you see, it don't even do it like a fraction of justice. We um, took a helicopter and flew inside the Grand Canyon. And I noticed something interesting. I noticed that these planes throughout the Grand Canyon are all flat. If you look at uh, in the textbooks, they tell us that, oh, these were the surface of the world many, many years ago. And you look, 270 million years ago, flat. 300 million years ago, flat. 340 million years ago, flat. 505 million years ago, flat. It appears that long ago, the surface of the world was completely flat. There was no wind, no rain, no erosion of any sort. Is this what we observe today? No. We observe the, the topography of the world is up and down and, and every which way. What's much more likely is that in a worldwide flood scenario, mud planes went in this direction, then another mud plane may have come in this direction, another one in that direction, and this would give flat layers. What about the geological chart? What does the geological chart say for us? You see, in the Mesozoic period, just after the Jurassic layer, we have something known as the Cretaceous layer. The Cretaceous layer is essentially a layer of chalk, and it predominantly consists of marine animals. Marine animals that have uh, died and formed chalk. Now, as you see in this image, on the left there is a huge Cretaceous layer. Um, on the right there is a very thin Cretaceous layer. Now this is something that we still, uh, it's still being formed today. For example, in the seas, as these uh, marine animals die, most of them are microscopic. As they die, they go, they sink down into the sea and they dissolve on their way down. However, there are some places where there are underwater mountains. And as these Cretaceous creatures are sinking, instead of dissolving on their way down, they hit the mountain. And you'll see underwater these mountains appear to be covered in snow. The, the tops of them have these Cretaceous creatures on them. Now, what does this have to do with our talk today? Well, the Cretaceous layer is one layer that is found throughout the whole world. It's said to be universal. Now, think about that for a second. This layer, which can only form underwater, is to be found everywhere on our world. What does that suggest? It suggests that the whole world was underwater at some point. If you go to the top of Mount Everest, you'll find something very interesting. You will find fossilized seashells. How did they get there? A worldwide flood offers a very good explanation to this. Another thing which I have only recently um, looked into is paleocurrents. Paleocurrents are um, interesting thing, what they look at is they look at the different layers that they're studying. So they say, okay, this is from the Mesozoic layer. And when they do a dig, they determine which way the direction of stream flow was in that dig. And they send this information and there's over a million recordings of paleocurrents all over the world. And what you can now do is you can see, okay, in the Mesozoic layer, you can look over the entire continent and see the direction of stream flow. And something very, very interesting happens. You see, what we observe today is on a continent, the direction of stream flow is, well, 
For example, in Australia, it would be out towards the sea on the edges. There may be a basin somewhere in the middle, so the uh, direction of stream flow may go to, towards the basin, depending on the topography of the, the country or the continent. However, if you look at paleo currents in the Mesozoic Age, for example, in America, you will find that over the entire country, they are all flowing predominantly in one direction. Now, what does this say? This tells us that during that time, the direction of stream flow was one direction over the entire country. Now, this would only be possible in a worldwide flood scenario. What's interesting is you look at the Mesozoic and it's in one direction, and you look at the Paleozoic, which is just underneath it, and you'll find that it's actually in the opposite direction. Again, over the entire continent. So, in a worldwide flood scenario, all the water was blowing in this direction, the mud plains got laid in this direction, and then the wind direction changed or something happened, and the water started going in this other direction. It makes perfect sense in a worldwide flood scenario. Now, a um, well-known evolutionist, Todd Scott, writes, even if all the data point to an intelligent designer, such a hypothesis is excluded from science because it is not naturalistic. Essentially, what Todd Scott is saying is, if it looks like a duck, if it smells like a duck, if it quacks like a duck, if it walks like a duck, and if it tastes like a duck, oh, wait a minute, we don't believe in ducks, it must be a puppy. We shouldn't be surprised at this, however. We're told that the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. Today's itching ears want to hear that there is no God. You're not responsible for the things that you do. Just do whatever you want. The Bible tells us that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And what science would like to sell to us today is to say that it's a question of faith versus fact. The simple-minded Christians, they have their faith. However, the scientists, we, we are based on fact. However, we've seen today that evolution cannot be proven. There are serious problems with the theory of evolution at each one of the steps. So it's no longer a faith versus fact, but it's a faith versus faith. And I personally believe you need much more faith to believe in evolution. If you look at the evidence for creation, the universe appears to have been made with us in mind. The galaxies, the solar system, the moon, even atoms were created with life in mind. The flat layers suggest a global flood. The Cretaceous layers and paleocurrents all suggest a worldwide flood. If you look at the evolutionary side of things, well, you have serious problems at each layer of the evolutionary process. So, at the end of the day, we have two options. We can believe, we can choose to have the faith in evolution. We can choose to believe that we arose from nothing, that life is meaningless, and that one day you will die and cease to be. Or, you can choose to have the faith in creation. In creation, we are sons and daughters of God. Life is full of purpose. And we are destined to live forever. As I was preparing this talk, it occurred to me that both what evolutionists believe and what creationists believe is true that will happen at the end of time. If you believe in evolution, you will die and cease to be. However, if you choose to put your faith in God and believe in creation, 
then you have the opportunity to live forever. We shouldn't be surprised at what we're seeing in the world today. In fact, Peter prophesied this over 1900 years ago. He writes in 2 Peter 3, verses 3 to 5, Above all, you must understand that in the last days scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming? He has promised. Ever since the ancestors died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens came into being and the earth was formed. You see, it says that they deliberately forget. People don't not believe in creation because there's a lack of evidence. Because there is far more evidence for creation than there is for evolution. So I want to invite you today, which one will you choose? Which one will you choose to be your faith? I don't know about you, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I would just like to close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for creating us, Father. We thank you that you are an amazing God. Father, we pray that you draw closer to us each day, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.